Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The dust transition and green hydrogen were in focus in South Africa again this week. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss developments in both areas. Hi Terence. Hi President Cyril Ramaphosa faced some sceptical questions from lawmakers about the proposed just transition offer. That's right. You know, at the beginning of COP on the sidelines, a number of developed countries uh, offered this $8.5 billion to support South Africa's just energy transition. It's very much an offer. It's not a transaction yet. And there's going to be a process over the next six months of actually uh, tying down what this offer means. And uh, obviously there was a lot of scepticism amongst um, parliamentarians as he faced these oral questions this week saying, isn't this sort of selling South Africa short? Um, how do we make sure that this isn't a sort of eroding our uh, sovereignty as a country? There was particularly an unhappiness that, uh, the, in the way that was presented, particularly by the US President Joe Biden when he announced the deal uh, and suggesting that it's going to be a wholesale decarbonisation which it would never really have been, but that is how it was presented. Uh, so basically saying we're selling the country short, we're giving away our sovereignty, and uh, how can we trust uh, these counterparties? So uh, I think that uh, uh, the president's facing similar pushback both inside his cabinet and inside his own uh, party, and is having to navigate this. It's inside government, there's concern about who the counterparties are, given that we are a BRICS member, and whether we shouldn't be doing more with, for instance, China, uh, Russia, India. Um, and then there's also concern about whether it's going to accelerate uh, our exit from coal too fast. So there's th those elements. Uh, and so I think he's, uh, he responded basically by saying that this is an offer. We're going to enter negotiations. We want to do this on a transparent basis uh, so that people have visibility of what, uh, the, what the transaction involves. And uh, he basically gave a commitment that we're not going to do anything that is against our developmental pathway. What should South Africa seek to secure at upcoming talks about the package? Well, I think well, the good thing uh, is that we've, we're going to set up this uh, interministerial committee to oversee these talks. Uh, the president himself is going to chair that, which is quite unusual. I think it's a, it's a significant amount of money in RAND terms, over 130 billion RAND, and it's over a three to five year horizon. So it is important, I think, that we have our line of march very clearly mapped out and we have leadership from the top on this issue. We're going to have then a technical committee below that with a number of financial sort of focus team uh, that includes the National Treasury, obviously, includes ESCOM, importantly, includes the Industrial Development Corporation, who have been given responsibility for driving the green hydrogen aspect of the deal and the electric vehicles. So that also makes sense. Uh, the President also indicated that there's going to be discussion with trade unions and civil society groups, which are also sceptical about this deal before anything's signed. I think, uh, you know, obviously South Africa is going to push as hard as possible to get as much grant finance as, as possible, no strings attached. That's going to be difficult. Most of that 8.5 billion will not be in the form of grant finance. There will be some elements of that, and we must ensure that goes to the things that cannot be financed through um, loans. And that's really the just, the just transition elements, the community, the reskilling. Uh, those, those sort of projects will have to be the main beneficiaries of the grant financing. Um, the concessional loans is going to be a big focus on how concessional, what is the difference between the interest rates that we can get on the open market and what we're going to get here. And uh, particularly given our, the stress of our fiscal balance sheet and ESCOM balance sheet. Obviously this is a government to government level so it doesn't directly necessarily have to affect the ESCOM balance sheet. But ESCOM's at a point where it can't absorb any more debt. And the country itself is at a point where it's, it's difficult to absorb fresh debt. But it is going to be raising regularly bonds anyway. So the lower the price of those bonds, the better in the long term, easier to repay. So it's all about you know, getting the best deal now. It's really focusing on where the grant finance must be directed to where there's no way even a DFI can fund the project, definitely not a commercial bank. 
um, the concessional loans, we need to get highly concessional terms. That must be the focus. And I think the president's approach saying that this uh, is a responsibility and a duty of development, developed countries, and it's, you know, they've made these commitments internationally to climate finance to support uh, poorer countries in their mitigation and uh, adaptation. Now they need to put their money where their mouth is, and we must hold them to that commitment. I think that's the correct approach. Again, also the transparency is important. That there's, uh, this is not a done deal. There's still a long way to go, but we need to enter it one with our eyes wide open, which I think uh, Parliament showed that there's a lot of scepticism around it. So I think our eyes are wide open. But two, uh, we should approach it with as an opportunity and not immediately dismiss it. And I think there has been, particularly in some elements of government, a too quick to dismiss both one, the counterparties and their trustworthiness and whether they'll really come to the party, but, and two, the whole financial aspect and whether we can absorb fresh debt. So I think we need to have, see this as an opportunity, embrace it as an opportunity, and not miss the opportunity. That if you know, if it doesn't materialise, well, then we have to we have to call out <laughs> the, the, the the rich countries and say, well, you made a commitment and you've reneged, and say that very clearly. But I think that's the sort of approach we need to take, rather than this defeatist attitude that we've seen uh, in the, the aftermath of the deal being announced. Green hydrogen is also included in the initial financing package. Yes, you know, green hydrogen and electric vehicles. We know that the big focus has to be Eskin and the electricity uh, system. That's where things are really collapsing at the moment and where there's a lot of strain. And uh, there's already a lot of pent up opportunity already made projects in the electricity space. We know that we need to invest massively in grid infrastructure. They've done very little to expand the grid at the pace and scale that we need, especially to facilitate renewable energy into the, the system. So that has to happen regardless, and it has to be financed. So if we can finance that cheaply, that's a, a real bonus for the country. There's also obviously the ability for Eskom to transition itself away from coal uh, into renewables, but, but there, uh, there's a lot of private action too and uh, it mustn't be done in a way that crowds out that private action. It must be complementary rather than a crowding out effect there. But then on the green hydrogen front, this is a huge opportunity for South Africa. We're one of the locations where it looks clear that we can produce competitively priced green hydrogen uh, for markets that can't. So it's really the Europeans and the Japanese being the two key markets. They just don't have the the renewable resources or the land to produce green hydrogen effectively. Basically, why you need uh, renewable resources is this, this has to be based on renewable electricity. Uh, renewable electricity is variable. You need a lot of land for that. You need the wind and the sun. And we've got that along with countries like Australia, Chile, uh, North Africa, and parts of the Middle East, we have that. There's a big opportunity to create a whole new market It'll be l far larger than our coal exports if we really, really tackle this opportunity. So uh, it is included in this just uh, energy uh, facility, supposedly. Uh, how that money, I think most of the money has to go to Eskom and to electricity, but I think some of it will be ready to prepare the way for a green hydrogen sort of a rollout uh, and supporting the initial projects and doing some of the thought leadership thinking that basically needs cheap money to try and do the, the research that we, uh, we need to do to try and get, and the pilot projects that we need to do to take us as a bridge, while green hydrogen still isn't competitive, it's still high cost, to take us over that bridge to when those electrolyzer costs come down and we can produce green hydrogen at the sort of, well, Japan wants $3 uh, dollars a kilogram by 2030. Uh, it really seems clear that we can do that. But the world wants much cheaper than that, more like the $1.50 a kilogram, and that would require a massive reduction in electrolyzer costs, and that requires innovation. And innovation needs projects and pilot projects, and South Africa should be one of those locations that rolls out these pilot projects. But there is more movement across the border, despite more positive study results at home. Yes, you know, Namibia has definitely started a green hydrogen march on South Africa. 
They've got this, they had their first uh, competitive bidding process. Nine companies or, or entities responded, uh, or nine projects, six entities uh, responded to that bidding process, which was launched in around June this year. And they announced at COP as well that they had selected their preferred bidder to build a $9 billion uh, green hydrogen project near Luderitz. And they see this as only the start of a bigger rollout of green hydrogen. It will be an economy changer for Namibia, which is a small population of less than 3 million people and a GDP of $10 million. I mean, when you've got one project alone that's in the sort of 9 billion category and potentially more to follow in this green hydrogen space, you can see it could be a major economy changer for Namibia. And they are moving at pace. Uh, and they are indicating that early next year there could be the next bidding rounds. So that they are well ahead of South Africa in terms of actually getting projects going. But South Africa has some advantages in its asset base and its industrial complex that should be exploited. The key one really being the fact that Sassel already is a big hydrogen producer, but it produces that from coal. So that if it can start producing hydrogen from uh, in a green way, using renewable electricity, uh, water, preferably not potable water, but it will initially be preferably moving to desalinated or treated mine water at some point. Uh, and uh, it's got the land. Uh, it can really, we could produce uh, green hydrogen, start displacing the coal-based hydrogen that they use in their processes in Sasselberg and Secunda, or Sasselberg's more gas play, but uh, Secunda. Uh, and to start producing through their Fischer-Tropsch process those chemicals and particularly fuel, so jet fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, which will be carbon neutral if it comes from green hydrogen. That, that's a big advantage that a lot of countries don't have, including Namibia. So we should be really looking to exploit that advantage. And we see Sassel is, uh, has got that uh, project um, underway. It's been submitted in front of the Germans, uh, which are helping to fund some, some of these projects. And that is shortlisted as one of the projects. So is one in Sasselberg. And then there's also south of the Namibian border, the Bukhubai uh, Greenfields project, which is a more audacious, larger scale, less linked to the current asset base. So there is this green hydrogen opportunity. There's definite movement. And there's also indications that, while well, mostly this is about an export uh, opportunity and mostly those exports will be in the form of green hydrogen derivatives rather than green hydrogen itself. I think uh, the, the transporting green hydrogen is going to be a challenge. Morocco is well placed for that. They don't have a long uh, distance away from Europe here. Yeah, I think we're going to be more sending out things like green ammonia. Uh, we're going to be sending out green steel, green uh, um, hot briquetted iron and those sort of derivative projects which are easier to transport and safer. But uh, be that as it may, uh, we also require some sort of domestic market. And CSIR has just published research to show they are around the two ports, uh, deep port of ports where initial green hydrogen projects could take place, which would be Kucha and uh, Saldana Bay. In the radius around that, there would be some immediate domestic green hydrogen offtake opportunities. The main one being marine bunker fuel in the form of ammonia to fuel those ships as they change their, uh, their fuel source to a more carbon friendly fuel source. But the second one to reopen in some form the ArcelorMittal Saldana steel facility up, up in Saldana, which could then use the hydrogen in its midrex process instead of coal to produce uh, a hot briquetted iron that would be considered green for exports to Europe initially. So there are immediate domestic opportunities. There's also some mobility opportunities, maybe around the ports, around the airports in those territories. But there would be a domestic base, uh, which is also important uh, to have that when you, well, even though I think the big opportunity for South Africa and hydrogen or green hydrogen is in the export markets. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.